who controls Libya's oil riches. Warlord Khalifa Haftar has launched a major offensive to drive rival groups in the so-called oil crescent. How does the fight for the oil revenue shape Libya's future? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. Today with me, Peter Dobby. Now, the battle to control the largest oil reserves in Africa has taken a new twist, which is turning off the lifeblood of the Libyan economy. Renewed fighting has shut down oil terminals and stopped oil tankers from loading around a quarter of a million barrels of daily exports. The warlord, Halifa Haftar, has launched an offensive to recapture the so-called oil crescent. His forces want to recapture the oil territory they seized two years ago including the two biggest oil ports. Haftar's determined to drive out fighters who attacked Ras Lanouf and Al Sidra on Thursday. The fighting has killed 28 people and warnings have been issued to stay away. The National Oil Corporation has evacuated workers from the terminals there. Libya's oil crescent stretches along the Mediterranean coast between the cities of Sirte and Benghazi to the east. Now, the region contains 80% of Libya's estimated 45 billion barrels of oil reserves, as well as huge amounts of gas. And it contains three of Libya's biggest oil fields, plus refineries producing about 60% of exports. Oil tankers dock at five main ports. Sidra is the largest, exporting 400,000 barrels a day, followed by Ras Lanouf at 220,000 barrels. OK, let's bring in our guests today here on Inside Story. Joining us from Tripoli is Salah El Bakush, a political analyst and senior advisor to the negotiating team of the High Council of States. From Cambridge, Rhiannon Smith, managing director of Libya Analysis, a consultancy research organisation. And from London, will be joined by Tim Eaton, research fellow in the Middle East and North Africa programme at Chatham House. Welcome to you all. Salah, if I can come to you first, is what we're seeing right now just a reaction to the latest very ugly, very damaging skirmishes, or are there other dynamics at play here? Well, uh, I, I think uh, what's happening at the uh, oil crescent is just a reminder for everybody that wants to know that the struggle is not, as some try to put it, between moderates and conservatives or between secularists and Islamists. It's actually a fight over who controls the uh, country's resources. Uh, uh, here we have uh, uh, al Jadran's forces taking over uh, in a similar operation as Haftar's in uh, September 2016, hardly uh, with a fight, took over uh, the uh, uh, oil crescent. Uh, Haftar did the same thing, took it over from Jadran in September 2016. Uh, was condemned by, then by uh, the uh, uh, USA and Great Britain and France in a communique, joint communique. And now we have another communique c condemning Jadran. And, the, uh, uh, and this vicious circle continues because there is no political solution in Libya and because certain powers, uh, including France, uh, is appeasing Haftar and trying to uh, put him as uh, the uh, leading figure in Libya. Rhiannon, how strong or otherwise are the opposing factions involved in this fight? Well, so the Khalifa Haftar's Libyan National Army, which is the group who had controlled uh, both Ras Lanouf and Sidra until a couple of days ago, and who are the ones who are now pushing back, they are relatively strong. They control most of eastern Libya. However, the issue currently is that Haftar and his forces are engaged in a campaign against the city of Derna uh, in the far east of Libya. And therefore, a lot of their forces are stretched thin over several fronts, both Derna also controlling the city in Benghazi and other parts of eastern Libya. So although on paper the LNA is strong, they have air support, which makes a big difference uh, in their ability to push back Jadran and his forces. They don't have the strength they have had in previous years. And this is probably one of the reasons why Jadran and his forces have chosen to strike now. On the other hand, Jadran, you know, we've seen him do these attacks uh, uh, last year, so 2017, a similar attack along with the Benghazi Defence Brigades, and they were defeated. They were pushed back quite easily. 
They don't seem to be particularly strong. However, the difference this time could be support from the tribal elements in the oil crescent. So the Magharba tribe uh, are the sort of local power in the area. And if they're able to get the support and maintain the support of that tribal group, that could make the difference. And that could mean this fighting could actually be prolonged for, for days, weeks and potentially even longer. And Tim, just take us through the economic damage here. I mean, what's it doing to the economy today and what might it do to the economy in the future? Well, as the first speaker indicated, the battle for resources within Libya is a major driver of the conflict. Libya's fragmentation on a political and a security level has effectively left uh, open competition for those resources in a number of different ways. And of course, oil um, revenues are the principal source of that struggle. And it should be noted that um, according to Libyan state figures from 2013 to 16, under Ibrahim Jedran's previous blockade, it was estimated that that cost the country $100 billion in that period. Clearly, um, Libya already operates a buff budget deficit, $10 billion, uh, 10 billion uh, dinars, sorry, last year. So this loss of these resources will have a deep impact and not help um, the existing problems that the country already has. We should note, of course, that the National Oil Company has been clarion in its calls for its need for investment to um, rehabilitate, to reconstruct infrastructure that had been damaged in previous rounds of fighting in this area. And we know already that the significant level of damage this time will um, further uh, damage that infrastructure and cause future problems. So where would the money come from to reconstruct it? These are likely to have long-term implications on the Libyan economy. Tim, one brief point. Where does Hafter get his resources from? I mean, who's backing him? Who's funding him? So it's somewhat unclear, but clearly uh, the battle over the budget, uh, to agree the budget earlier this year with, between uh, rival uh, actors in Libya, one of the major sticking points was over the salaries given to Hafter's uh, so-called uh, Libyan National Army. And so clearly it receives a degree of state funding through the, that dispensation. But it's also clear that Hafter has received a lot of support externally, principally from the United Arab Emirates, and that's been documented in UN reports. In addition to that, uh, the LNA and uh, political actors in the East have also tried to forge economic policies. So we've seen uh, particularly bonds been issued from Eastern banks to ensure liquidity. We've seen um, dinars printed in Russia to aid the uh, Eastern economy. And also, uh, we see uh, indications that the LNA has tried to emulate uh, the Egyptian army in many ways in terms of its revenue generating model. So we've seen the creation of an LNA investment authority, and we've seen various moves by LNA uh, actors and linked groups to um, increase their revenue generating models. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag in that sense. Salah, can you just name down, uh, nail down for us one aspect of the terminology here? Is Hafta, is he a warlord? Is he a renegade general? Is is he a freedom fighter? Is he an aspirational politician? Which is it? Hafter started out in 2014 by announcing at, uh, on television that he's taken over. He's suspending the uh, elected uh, General National Congress then, and uh, he, suspe uh, he was suspending the uh, constitutional declaration. And that thing fizzled within hours, and uh, his prime minister now issued an arrest warrant for him. He came back four months later and said he's going to fight terrorism now in Benghazi. And then he's, he got in a fight in Benghazi and announced that he will quit after he uh, uh, liberates Benghazi. He liberated Benghazi, and now he's looking to be the president of Libya. And uh, uh, France, France is the main culprit in this. France issued a statement in 2016 after Haftar took over the, uh, uh, the oil crescent and called them a military, uh, a, a, an, ar uh, an armed group. Less than a year later, invited him to the LSA and uh, treated him as uh, uh, head of state. And we saw that again on, uh, uh, in May of this, uh, of this year. So here we go. Uh, people call it the Libyan National Army. You can call, you can call your, uh, your uh, armed group anything you want. We saw that in Africa in the uh, Lord's Army and in Lebanon, the, uh, uh, the, the Party of God, and so on. 
But the fact is, it's a military, it's an armed group, and we saw the atrocities that it committed in Benghazi, and the atrocities it is committing in Derna now, and the international community has to uh, uh, heed that and uh, make a decision. Maybe, maybe uh, offer the Libyan government to, uh, uh, to provide uh, NATO troops or something to guard these facilities from Jadra and from Haftar and from anybody else. Rhiannon, given what we're discussing today, uh, his desire to take and maintain control of this oil crescent with the potential economic impact of that, you've already talked about Derna. What happens if the oil crescent becomes another Derna? It doesn't, Derna doesn't seem to have much strategic importance, but then what happens if Derna becomes another Benghazi? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think first I'd just like to address a point as well made by Saleh there that um, as he's outlined, you know, Haftar has gone from being this essentially warlord renegade to now being a figure who is uh, attending these um, high-level state meetings. And one of the key factors that enabled him to gain this international legitimacy was his control of the oil crescent. As soon as he took control and had the leverage that that gave him and the fact that he kept the oil crescent open, he kept the ports operating, that gave him a great deal of international legitimacy and he's been able to use that to great effect since then. So the oil crescent, in that sense, Jadran is likely wanting to, to do a similar move. You know, if he can control the oil crescent ports and if he can keep the oil flowing, which he has said this time he wants to do, which it previously he hadn't done, then that could give him this kind of um, legitimacy. Haftar is not going to let that happen easily. If Haftar loses control of the oil crescent, he, that'll be a big blow to his political leverage and legitimacy domestically and internationally. But as you've pointed out, the danger with that could be that if he uh, kind of redirects forces from Derna, then he could, um, you know, fight back in the oil crescent and take control there. But then Derna, would, the situation there would become worse and that could be a drawn out situation. Or as you've pointed out, what we could see in the oil crescent is protracted fighting so that some of the people, the residents in that area, could, could rise up against them. At the moment, these clashes haven't affected the oil fields themselves. They've just impacted the oil ports. However, if we start seeing um, local protests, local communities, local militias starting to side with one or the other, um, then we could see more blockades at, and more damage at the fields themselves. And the final thing I want to mention in terms of how this could really impact on a, a political and conflict um, sort of scenario across Libya is that if Haftar pushes further east, that brings him into contact with Sirte and Maserata. And what we could see if there's a big long-term destabilisation in the oil crescent is that this will touch on both east and west Libya. And actually this could prolong and, and spark off a conflict that could bring in the whole country and could reignite some of the existing political and economic divides that, that are already present in Libya. Tim, is there a, another global uh, aspect to this? I guess it's a fiscal corollary, if you will, in as much as the Iran oil production industry is already battling its way through sanctions or trying to survive sanctions, on top of which, if the oil production in Libya begins to dip, those customers that have got the signed paperwork, they've signed the deals, people like Venezuela, some of the Latin American countries, they are simply not going to get the oil on the boats that take the oil to the people that need it. That's true, but I think um, there's a very uh, so slightly unsaid uh, dimension to this is in the international community's activities towards this. Some people say that the internationals uh, haven't done enough. Uh, I've been writing about the growth of protection markets in Libya, the competition for resources, you know, the fragmentation which allows moves such as Jadran to have such a major impact. But actually what the international community has done in the oil crescent has made it clear that only sales through the national oil company will be permitted. And um, certainly, as Rhiannon pointed out, uh, Haftar's agreement that that would be the case when he took over the oil crescent in 2016 garnered him a degree of legitimacy among the internationals. So I think it's important to note that whoever controls the oil crescent at, m at the moment is going to have to probably deal with Tripoli and is going to have to deal with the Trip Tripoli's national oil company for sales onto the international market. Now, of course, the fighting around the area could reduce those flows, could reduce exports, and undoubtedly will have a, an impact on, on production. But I think that this is an important uh, level of the, um, of the conflict, because previously when Jadran had controlled the area and operated a blockade, he had tried to sell crude directly internationally. And I think it's telling that that resulted in US Marines boarding the, the tanker and effectively shutting that attempt down. So since that point, 
the, it's been made clear that Libya's oil wealth, at least being sold into international markets, has been off the table for the local actors within Libya. So I think that that's uh, important. It's going to be important in the months to come. Salah in Tripoli, could the temperature be taken out of this if outside countries took a step back and they froze their relationship with Khalifa Haftar? I mean, he is... He has consistently over the past year or so worked on his relationship, for example, with the Kremlin. So if the Russians just said, you're on your own for the next six months, would that ease tensions in this area? Well, uh, the Russians are obviously using Libya. They have no interest in uh, establishing bases or anything like that. Uh, they, they are using Libya as a, a, a card they can play for other uh, concessions somewhere else. Uh, but, but the, da the, danger, the danger now is that uh, the pr uh, protracted uh, uh, conflict in the oil crescent, and then it wouldn't matter who is controlling it because there would be no production going out of those terminals. The, uh, the international community has to tell Haftar that you are not going to be able to ram yourself through the political agreement. Look now what, what, what the international community has allowed Haftar to do. It allowed Haftar to uh, run roughshod over the political agreement and cancel the political agreement signed in Sherat in December 2015. And he has now forced the, the, the uh, international community, and you can look at the uh, communique coming out of Paris, to abandon the constitutional referendum. So now we are going to do some elections for president to satisfy Haftar and the Egyptians and the Emiratis without a constitution that was approved by two-thirds of a duly elected body in uh, uh, last year. So now they're going to allow him to do whatever, take over the East and take over the, uh, the Oil Crescent and impose his will on everybody else. And the uh, international community makes pronouncements and doesn't stick to it. That's what we have now, and I think this is, will continue. And these, uh, uh, these kind of uh, actions by Jidran and others will continue, and maybe we'll see the conflict move to Tripoli if Haftar has uh, control over Derna and the Oil Crescent again, and he will turn him, uh, his attention to Tripoli. He has no intention of uh, doing a democratic uh, uh, process in Libya, and he announced that several times on uh, international uh, media and in uh, conferences. Rhiannon, is there another part to this ghastly jigsaw that we haven't touched on yet? A an organisation that nobody could easily get to, nobody could easily get leverage with, and it's ISIL towards the south of the country. I mean, what's the relationship between ISIL and Al-Qaeda? Some analysts are saying they're actually sharing information, they're sharing intelligence, and they, they didn't really get to a stage where they were on the receiving end of a, a killer blow, if you will. Yeah, and this is what's been very interesting, actually, uh, over the past couple of months, actually, in the Oil Crescent area and just to to the west in the kind of more central uh, desert south of Sirte. We've seen a, a big increase in the last couple of months of ISIS attacks, both uh, further um, east near Ajdabia, which is sort of the heart of the area of the Oil Crescent that Haftar does control, attacks against LNA fighters, and also further uh, west towards Beni Walid, there have been a few attacks as well. And yes, there have been a lot of reports coming out of both ISIS and al-Qaeda operatives in that area. The U.S. just over the last week has done two or three separate airstrikes, one against ISIS fighters, the other against al-Qaeda fighters. And there are many reports coming out that they are actually working together or communicating, collaborating in this area to the south of Libya. And this is significant because, you know, ISIS was driven out of Sirte at the end of 2016, but they weren't completely vanquished. And what we're seeing is that this area in the oil crescent in central Libya has essentially become this no-man's land that it was before. And actually this lack of having a strong force there, it's essentially the kind of border border between the west and the east of Libya um, has allowed these groups to, to emerge again and seem to have some capability to launch strikes. There's no sort of evidence or proof at the moment of direct collaboration between Jadran and, and the sort of Benghazi Defence Brigade forces and these elements, but there's no doubt that it supports both of them if, if there's greater insecurity in the area, if the security forces are more stretched. And so this is another reason why the oil crescent and the, that central Libyan uh, area 
you know, it could be a real cause for stability and could be a driver of, of wider spread conflict between Masrata, the GNA, LNA, and also the south, the area around Sebha, where there has, of course, been a conflict going on since February in around Sebha, uh, which is another element that's driving some of this conflict and the taboo that are involved in that. Tim, in London, assuming for a second that Salah's analysis is correct and uh, I'll have to... He, he maybe wouldn't shy away from the idea of ending up in a conflict, in a conflagration in Tripoli. Does that tilt the country towards... It's not at the moment, but does it tilt it towards being a failed state? Well, I think by all measures it is already. If you look at the situation on the ground, such is the degree of fragmentation. I think that Libya is almost uh, defined by its local actors, by the strength of its uh, periphery rather than national actors. There are very few national actors in Libya. And indeed, um, Haftar's narrative has long been that he has the institutional force to be able to provide order, to be able to control the country. But we've seen in these um, incidents in, in the Old Crescent, uh, Ibrahim Jedran comes back from exile from, um, from outside Libya, smuggled back in, doesn't actually need to generate a great degree of force to go back in and take uh, a major part of, of Libya's oil wealth for how long it will remain to be seen. But I think that that's a telling story. So this has happened before, as Rhiannon mentioned, in, I think, 2017. So Haftar's narrative that he could control the whole of the country is clearly uh, fundamentally undermined. He doesn't have that capacity, but neither do any of his opponents. And I think that this kind of uh, conditions the operating environment for these largely local forces who are strong in their local area, have strong interests to push, but who can't um, actually determine the national picture. So uh, again, Rihanna mentioned the Magaha in the um, Oil Crescent, clearly a very powerful set of actors there. But how far can they actually extend that influence beyond? Well, that's unclear. So what we see, I think, across the country are a, lo a lot of predominantly local actors seeking to improve their position tactically ahead of some kind of political settlement which will, you know, realign um, the, um, uh, the country. And I think this is likely to continue, particularly while there's such a limited prospect of national level forces and national level credible institutions which can push back against these kinds of developments. So Salah, if everyone involved in what we're seeing right now in this oil crescent doesn't have the resources or literally the manpower to carry through on what they ultimately want to get to, I guess that explains why Libya's neighbours, East and West, are looking in on the current situation, and they're nervous. They're feeling very, very uncomfortable about this. Well, uh, Libyan neighbors. Uh, uh, f first, I, j I just want to uh, uh, talk about the lo local, uh, uh, the locals in this conflict. Jadran now used the same tactic that Haftar used in 2016. He got agreement among the tribes that were fed up with Haftar's people controlling everything. He brought people from outside the area, controlling everything. And now they made peace with Jadran, their son, actually, and allowed them to take the oil crescent without much of a fight. And that's the same thing that Haftar did in 2016. So this gives you an impression of the popularity of Haftar waning in that area. I mean, he came in and he took the, the elected mayor of Ujdabia, the, the main city in, the, in that area, and replaced him with a, a military man and took out, you know, everybody else that's related to Jadran, who is the son of the Magharba tribe. Salah, I'm going to stop you there because I do want to put the last but point on the, the program I mean, to Rhiannon Smith it, in Cambridge. Rhiannon, oil production at the moment is less than 25% yes. of what yes. it was before they got rid of Gaddafi. Is it your sense, in 20 seconds, please, is it your sense Libya is going to get worse before it gets better? In terms of oil production, I think in the near future, yes, it will get worse um, because I think this fighting is going to continue and the storage capacity at some of these port oil ports has been damaged. However, in the longer term, over the sort of next year or two, I think we could still see levels staying at a similar level to they are now, around a million barrels a day if the situation calms and because there's so much investment from the NOC and other uh, actors investing in oil and ultimately oil is Libya's lifeline and therefore it really needs to be sustained at high levels and I think actors will do what they can to make that happen.
OK, we are done. Thank you so much to all our guests, Salah El Bakush, Rhiannon Smith and Tim Eaton. And thank you to you too for your company in the last half hour. You can see the programme again anytime via the website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do check out our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. That's at AJ Inside Story or tweet me. I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby One. From me, Peter Dobby and the entire team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll do it again tomorrow. Bye-bye.